Good morning. morning. Welcome to the Lamb of God. Welcome to the second Sunday in Advent. It's great to have you all here, all of you that are here in the sanctuary. And there's a good number of you. Good to see you out on this cold morning. And also those of you that have chosen to worship with us at home, our greetings to you. May the Holy Spirit who is with us be with you and enliven your worship and your time in the presence with our Lord and Savior. I want to thank all of you who participated in our week-long decorating exercise. Uh, Many of you were here for the culmination of it on Friday when we finished up in here and in the fellowship hall. And then, of course, we had pizza. Uh, Tim here? No. 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 Thank God for Tim going and picking up the pizza. He has a connection. His son works at Jets. And we don't want to overuse this, but through through, uh, Tim's connection, the pizza that we got for decorating the church was free. I think we call that grace. But thank you, those of you that didn't come on Friday but came throughout the week. Does not our sanctuary look beautiful? In our fellowship hall, in our narthex. And hopefully that helps you move your spirit to prepare to welcome the arrival of the Savior, not just as we celebrate it on Christmas, but as we look forward to his return on the last day. Part of our celebration involves midweek Advent services, and those are going on. We've got one this coming, uh, the, coming up this coming Wednesday. Soup supper will be at 5 o'clock, and it will be chicken and dumplings. And then uh, worship will be at 7 o'clock. Our Advent theme that we are going through is called This Is My Son. Last week we looked at Cain, who was not the perfect son, the one that was promised. We'll look at another imperfect son this week. It's called This Is My Son Ishmael. And really it focuses on how Abraham, who is, uh, was declared right with God by faith, struggles with his faith and goes outside of God's plan and we see how that results. But still, the Lord sent his son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to correct Abraham's faults, yours and mine. Lots of activities coming up. You can check them out in news and notes. We have our normal Wednesday Bible studies on uh, our normal weekday Bible studies on Monday at one and Wednesday at ten thirty. An elders meeting on Monday. Tuesday is the LWML dinner at Golden Corral, and all of you women are invited to join them. There's information in your news and notes. There's a practice for our all ages Christmas service this coming Saturday from ten to one, and we will feed them. And of course, it's our favorite food, pizza, so come for that. So next Sunday will not be a normal worship service. It will be our all-ages children's program. So please come for that. There will not be communion, but please come and watch somebody other than me give you the message. Fred, you'll be quite happy. Just kidding. (laughs) Other items to note, uh, and these are all in your news and notes, the Toys for Tots bin is up, the mitten tree is up. Uh, We've got a new Flint Mission Network gathering. They're looking for shampoo, men and women's. Our Christmas Eve services will be on uh, uh, Christmas Eve from 3 p- at 3 p.m. and one at 10 p.m. And then we will have a Christmas Day service at 11. All three of those services where we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper. Finally, script orders are being taken today. This is the script order before Christmas. And there is big news for those of you that, like McDonald's, they now have McDonald's gift cards in $10 and $25 amounts. See... Uh, Ruth Wass afterwards in the fellowship hall and you can place your order. With that, you know what, let's, uh, yeah, let's do this. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take a moment and share that peace with one another with a wave of the hand and a smile. In fact, you can even say peace be with you and then wave to the camera, peace be with you those of you that are worshiping at home. And before we begin with our opening worship service, please join me as I prepare my heart and mind to lead you in worship and worship our Lord and Let us now begin with our opening hymn on Jordan's Bank, The Baptist Cry.
as you are able. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and has raised him from death to everlasting life and for his sake forgives you for every one of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together let us responsively read the introit. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Remember the wondrous works that he has done. O oh, offspring of Abraham, his servant. Of Jacob, his one. He is the Lord our God. He remembers his covenant forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to make ready the way of your only begotten Son, that by his coming we may be enabled to serve you with pure minds. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 11. It's Isaiah's prophetic word, and it's got kind of two parts here. It's been compared to, you know, those pictures where you have one on one side and one another, and it folds like a book? The first picture is of the one who would come, the one who is promised, the Messiah, and the second picture is the kingdom that he will bring, the everlasting kingdom of peace, the return to the Garden of Eden. From Isaiah 11, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. 
and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with his breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Our epistle lesson comes from Romans chapter 15. This is Paul emphasizing the fact that although Jesus came from the Jews and the original promise of the Messiah was for the Jews, God's original intention was not just to save the Jewish people or Israel, but all people through the one and only Messiah who is to come. Paul writes, Whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Therefore, welcome one another, as Christ has welcomed you, for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant to the circumcised to show God's faith truthfulness, in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I would invite you to stand as you are able. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the third chapter. Glory <clears throat> to you, o Lord. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <clears throat> for this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw <clears throat> many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee the wrath to come? 
bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he is coming after me. He is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the Gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> Together let us give voice to our Christian faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord and may be seated. And I would invite the younger children to join me up front for a message just for them. I don't know if you remember last Sunday, but I, we started talking about how this space is different when we worship, and how we do things to kind of impress on you that this is holy time, time with Jesus. All right. So instead of you guys sitting there, we're going to actually go do a little field trip. So stand up. <laughs> Come on up here. Let's look at the few things that we have, some of the decorations. Now, first of all, do you remember the color of everything in here, my stole, and these pyramids that hang. Do you remember what they were all summer long? It was the same color over and over again. Not pink. Not red. Blue. Not blue, they're blue now. Green, yes. All summer long is the season of Pentecost, and Pentecost is green. And perhaps when we get to Pentecost next year, I'll tell you why. But they've changed to blue. And colors, oops, sorry, colors in the church mean something, they have a meaning, and blue for Advent means hope. And what will we be hoping for at Advent? That God will save us. How about that he has already sent his son to save us on Christmas morning? And Christmas morning tells us that he will come again, and that is our hope, and that is why it's blue. You see that my stole is blue, and by the way, the pastor stole, do you know why I wear this? Because they told me at seminary I had to. <laughs> no. You know, the, the origins, I looked it up, the origins are not really clear, but in, in, in the synagogue, at least in modern day times for Jews, 
When somebody gets up to pray, they have a shawl that they put over their head. It covers their head and it flows down in front of them, kind of like this. And so it's said that this is kind of a symbol of the one who leads worship, the one who's been ordained by the congregation to lead worship, to preach and teach. So what else do we have on here? We have candles. Candles, candles. What do you think a candle means at Advent? What does a candle do? What? Is that what you were going to say? No. What were you going to say? <laughs> it burns your finger? No! You got it. It's light. And we have a candle. What does light mean in the way of Jesus? What was, what was his coming? It's coming in the name of the Lord. Lord. He, he was the Lord coming into a darkened world to bring light, the light of faith. And so that's what our candles represent, is Jesus coming and bringing the light of faith. And then we have angels. We have an angel there, and we have an angel here, and we have more angels all over the tree here. Why do we have angels? Yeah, when Jesus was born, angels announced his birth. But there's also this. The word angel actually comes from a Greek word that means messenger. And most of the time we talk about heavenly messengers from God, but even John the Baptist was a angelic kind of messenger from God. And we at Advent, we get to tell other people about the real reason we celebrate Christmas. And so we are messengers too. Next week we'll talk about the four candles that are up here. We'll talk about the Advent wreath. What else do we have on here? We have a dove. Why do we have a dove? What does a dove represent? Baptism, yeah, but somebody's special presence in baptism. The Holy Spirit, because in Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit is like a dove descending. Over here, this banner says, O come, Emmanuel. And that's from, a test, that's from an Old Testament prophecy. Anybody know what Emmanuel means? It means God with us. And that was what Isaiah prophesied, that there would be a child that would come and he would be God with us. And is that not Jesus? Is Jesus God with us? He is. All right, a couple more things to look at. Over here. You can come over here. Come on, this is a field trip. A field trip, yeah. On this banner, what do the words say? Can you read the words on there? Actually, start here. This is love. God sends his son. And then we have these, I believe they're supposed to be angels, and we have a special kind of cross that looks like a P. And this, this is actually from a Greek letter. It's called the chai Rho, And it's the first two Greek letters of the word Christ, which means Messiah, anointed one. One more, let's go over here. Be careful, everybody, kids coming by. <laughs> they may smack you. Right here, what do we have? We have, what is that? A cross. And what's on top of the cross? A crown. A crown. Now, the cross reminds us of who? Jesus. Jesus. But why would there be a crown? He's the baby who came to rule by dying on the cross. On the cross is how he showed that he is the true king, the only one that could die and save his people. These are Greek letters, Alpha and Omega, first and the last. Christ encompasses the entire word of God from beginning to end. And then finally we have a lamp with a flame. What do you think that means? God's word is a light to my feet and a lamp to my path. Christ comes and fills God's word to be our light, to show us salvation, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. So let's head back up.
You guys can sit if you want. <clears throat> so these are just a few things that when we walk in here and we sit down and we get ready for worship, we can look around and be reminded of things, right? Christ is the light of the world. Angels announce them, but we are to be angels and messengers. He is the Messiah that was promised. He is the first and the last. He is your Savior. And blue, well, that means this is a season of hope. Because he came as a baby, we can look forward with hope that he will come again, and all the problems that you have in this world will be gone. And that picture that he painted in Isaiah of everybody and everything living in peace that will be our future by faith. And that is worthy of prayer, and prayer is part of worship, so let's worship him right now with prayer. And you can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for all these reminders of who you are and what you came to do. To be the light of faith in our darkened world and in my heart. Help me always to hold on to you as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can go back to your parents. There will be a test on everything that we covered at the end of service. Nah, this is grace. You guys all passed. We continue on with our sermon hymn. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Congregation may be seated. The sermon today comes from our gospel lesson, particularly these verses from Matthew 3, 8 through 12. I've entitled it, Repentance Worthy of Eternity. I've waited. I've waited all year long to be able to say this to you, Happy Advent, you brood of vipers. What a great Advent greeting, isn't it? That's our buddy John the Baptist. I have, you know, I'm sitting here and it gets late and you have weird thoughts and I was thinking of what it would be like if he was really here. What would he be like? Can you picture him at the store, standing in line at some grocery store at Myers, or at the department store with all the Christmas shoppers and 
the lines are long and everybody's going slow and he's there, hurry it up, you brood of vipers. I thought about inviting him and having him preach this message. In fact, I even tried to call him. He picks up the phone and says, what do you want, brood of viper? And I just hang it up. Why? Why is he so grumpy? And it's not just this greeting. Here's the other thing I've been waiting for, and this happens occasionally in our gospel lesson. So this is the final verse of our gospel lesson. <clears throat> his winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the gospel of the Lord. <laughs> Doesn't really fit, does it? Unquenchable fire. This is the gospel of the Lord. But perhaps there's some important things that we need to hear in this message. Even though it pops up every third year at Advent, John the Baptist preaching his sermon, perhaps there's some applicable stuff to us today. His message is summed up in this verse, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. A good law message, isn't it? Repent, because the end is coming. In fact, <clears throat> let's greet each other with that. Say with me together, one, two, three, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Good. Now turn to your neighbor and say the same thing on three. One, two, three. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Good Old Testament kind of message, isn't it? Heavy on the law. Perhaps it's just John the Baptist. Maybe he was just a grumpy guy. But in Matthew, you turn ahead a chapter or so, and you find Jesus, his first sermon is the same message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now this is definitely a message that the people at that time needed to hear, but I'll bet this is a message that you and I need to hear and contemplate as well. So let's take a look at what John the Baptist was doing and what he was preaching and maybe figure out the why behind it and even what is this thing called repentance. We're told that Jerusalem and Judea were all flowing out to see John the Baptist. He's out in a wilderness area. Picture a place that's not like barren, dry desert, but just a place where there isn't anybody. There's no inhabitants. There's trees. There's the river. There's the Jordan flowing through. Probably the Jordan River down towards to, but not quite where it empties into the Dead Sea. That's where John is at, at, and that's where he's baptizing. He's baptizing, and people are coming, being baptized, and confessing their sins. Now, he's there dressed to fulfill a stereotype. He is the consummate Old Testament prophet. Rough clothes, camel's hair, not very comfortable. His diet, the kind of things that you would find in the wilderness, locusts and wild honey. He is fitting the stereotype of the one he was prophesied to be, the second coming of Elijah. Not the resurrection of Elijah, but the consummate Old Testament prophet in keeping with Elijah. And such is his message, a very Old Testament message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's been 400 years since there's been a prophet to speak God's word. Micah was the last one. Then there's a long silence. And people are waiting. And they're doing what they can to hold on to this promise of a Savior to come. But as natural with us, their focus wanes. And they start trusting in other things other than God's promise. And John is called to shake them back into reality, to bring them back into line. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. These people are coming because finally the Lord is speaking, and many of them are listening. They are confessing their sins. And what would be the sins that John wanted them to confess? All the ways and places they placed their trust, which was not in God's word, which was not in his promise. What kind of things would they trust? Well, all the things they held in their hand. 
who they are, their houses, their children, what they could do, but especially who they were as Jews, who they were as the descendants of Abraham. John wanted to take them away from that, to move them to confess that those are not places to look to find the answer, to find hope, to find forgiveness, but to turn back and hold fast to God's promises. Now, this repentance, well, there's more than one kind of repentance. This is a repentance of somebody who doesn't have faith and is coming to faith. This is the repentance of an unbeliever being converted into faith. Luther has this to say about what this kind of repentance is. Such a preparation is spiritual. It consists of the deep conviction and confession that you are unfit, a sinner, poor, damned, and miserable with all the works you are able to do. Where this conversion is wrought, the heart will be open for the Lord's entrance and his forgiveness of sins. And here's why John is preaching this kind of repentance, because trusting in anything else besides God's promises, their hearts were closed. Know that the Holy Spirit is there working. He's the one that's moving them to confess that they've been trusting in the wrong thing and to move them to turn back to this trust in the Messiah who is to come because the kingdom of heaven, the reign and rule of God is at hand. It's coming now. And they believe it. And they are converted and turned back to faith in God. Many of them. Unfortunately, as it is in the world, not all of them. But when John saw that many of the Pharisees and Sadducees were coming to his baptism, he said to them, Say it with me. You brood of vipers who warned you to flee the wrath to come. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Brood of vipers. You know what he's calling them? Well, there was a viper or a serpent or a snake that started man way back when in the garden down the road to sin and trusting in things other than the Lord, and that was Satan. He is calling them not the sons of God, but the offspring of Satan. Why is that? Well, they've come to be baptized. In fact, many commentators think that they were actually in a group headed down in the water to receive the baptism. The only problem is they're not confessing any sin. Their heart hasn't been converted. They don't think they need that. Definitely the Pharisees. The Pharisees say, we keep the laws. We're not on the wrong side of God. We earn his forgiveness. In fact, there's nothing to forgive. We keep his laws perfectly. In fact, we not only keep his laws, we keep the tradition of the elders, which work as a hedge around those laws. Because we obey them, we know that we will never transgress God's laws. Well, maybe not with your hands, but with your mind and your heart. That's a whole other thing. The Sadducees, we're not really too sure where they were at. Only that they seemed to believe that they could choose to obey God. That they could make a choice and it counted before God. Both of them are doing this. They're both looking to who they are in regards to Abraham. In fact, John will go on to say, Don't say to yourselves that because you are a child of Abraham, you are saved. It's not blood. It's not the relation to Abraham that saves you. It's not trust in Abraham. Abraham was declared righteous, but only because he trusted and had faith in the promises of God. And there is the key to being right before God, and it's what they missed. Not faith in who you are by your blood, but who God is for you and the promises he's given you, and especially the promise of this one to come. They needed conversion. And until they changed their hearts and their minds, John was not about to baptize them and make them think that they were right when they're not. How about you? 
Am I looking at a congregation of a brood of vipers? No, I am not. None of you are broods of vipers because none of you are unconverted. I would wager that you here are trusting in your Lord Jesus Christ through your baptism. A baptism that was like John's except, well, John's looked forward to the promise of the coming Messiah. Ours looks back to the completed work. Ours was commanded by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And in your baptism was sent the Holy Spirit who converted you, who turned your heart away from trusting in anything and everything else to trust in Jesus Christ. That his death on the cross, his suffering and death forgave all of your sins, all of the ways you trust in other things besides him. He took them all away and gave to you his obedience, all the ways that he did trust and obey God. And to know that it is true, we have the empty tomb, the resurrection, and the promise and hope of your future to come. You are not a brood of viper. You're a precious child of the Heavenly Father, made so by the work of the Holy Spirit, by grace, through faith, all pointed to Jesus Christ. So we got nothing to worry about, right? We're not them. We're not those people back then that need conversion. We're not the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Except this. John says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Fruit, works, good works, works that show your faith, works that show unselfish love to your neighbor because of who God is in your life. How you doing with that? I'm doing pretty poor. I see a lot of works in my life based on me and myself for my own good. And those that I do for the good of others, well, a lot of times they're a bit reluctant. There's a problem with that. John tells us that the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. There's that last day judgment coming. And if we were judged on the ability to produce fruit, the kind of fruit that we produce, yeah, we might produce it, but a lot of times it's sour. Guess what? When the end comes, you'll not be the wheat gathered into the barn. You would be the ones thrown into the flames of eternal fire. Except you will not be. And that's because the Holy Spirit is at work to produce another kind of repentance in you. Repentance of faith. One who is brought to mind of all the ways and all the things that we might trust in. Our houses, our homes, our cars, our bank accounts, who we are, who we present ourselves to be. Maybe even those works that we do. Except the Holy Spirit comes and turns us back and says, no, Trust in the one whose name you were baptized in. The one who you confess and believe to be your Lord and Savior. And you can do that because he forgives every single time you place trust in anything and everything else. His grace continues to flow to you. Your end will not be the inextinguishable fire. Your end is the one that Isaiah pictured in our Old Testament lesson. Animals, they used to be at odds that would hunt and kill each other, living in peace. The lion and the sheep and the ox and the cobra and even the snake and the little kid can play over the hole of the snake. Why? Because peace will reign and rule throughout the new heaven and the new earth forever. Peace will rule among us forever. No longer will you sin against your neighbor with anger or with jealousy. You will live in godly peace and love. Gathered into his storehouse, his barn, his eternal life in the new heavens and the new earth. That's your future and that's my future and it's a wonderful future. 
And it happens because of this. Because Christ came with a mightier baptism than John's, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. <coughs> Planted the Holy Spirit in your heart to continue that work of repentance because we need it every day. We wake up in the morning and find ourselves trusting in something else, ourselves. We find ourselves wanting to do our will and not his will. And the Holy Spirit is there to turn us back to him. Remembering that we were washed clean in our baptism. But there's also this thing about fire. There's the unquenchable fire at the end that is judgment against the, sin, against the unbelievers. But this is a different fire. This is a purifying fire. A refining fire. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to keep you in faith. To keep you confessing your sin and turning back to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to point to the ways that we transgress his laws and trust in other things and to move us back. And how does the Holy Spirit do that? Through the means of grace. He's doing it right now. He's doing it through this message, through the readings that we had, through the hymns that we sing, through Christ's presence in the sacrament. Renewing your faith in Christ moving you to once again trust only in him. That's our life as Christians. Wake up in the morning, pray to him, ask forgiveness for the previous day, and know that you receive it by his hand. And what's your part in it? Make available yourselves to the means of grace. Pray. Do a devotion every day. Be in his word, hear him speak, and return back and speak to him. Study his word. Do what you're doing here today. Worship. Take the sacrament. Allow the Holy Spirit access to your life and to work in it. To move you to this constant repentance. To do as we did at the beginning of the service, to confess our sins and hear his absolution and hold fast that that is the truth. And through the power of that, say, I want to go tomorrow and do better. And when I don't, and my better will never be perfect, I'm forgiven. And I'm picked up, and I'm encouraged to keep trying. Knowing that on the last day, when Christ appears, I will finally be perfect. Because he will make me perfect. That's the repentance you and I have by faith. The ongoing work of your baptism. Worthy of eternal life. So, Happy Advent, you who are not broods of vipers. Happy Advent to you who are precious children of the Heavenly Father, made so by Jesus Christ, whose spirit walks with you and lives with you every day, who encourages you to godly repentance, who helps you to follow the path of obedience, forgiving you when you veer, so that on the last day you will stand before the gates of that eternal paradise where peace will reign among all creatures, including us forever. Come Lord Jesus. Amen. This would be the time in the worship service when we would pass the offering plate. We simply mention it to remind you that we do have an offering box out of the narthex if you'd like to give an offering. Visitors are not required to. If you'd like to give one, the narthex offering box is there. There's a box across from the uh, church office. You can mail your offering in or use our online giving portal. Our offering verse for today comes from Matthew 3, chapter, Matthew chapter 3, verse 8. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. I would invite you now to stand as we sing praise and thanksgiving to our Heavenly Father.
congregation may be seated for the prayers. You can be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you stir the hearts of your faithful to prepare us for the advent of your Son. We implore you, feed us continually with your word and sacraments as we look for his return. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, by the ministry of your holy church, prepare the way for your Son's return in glory. Send forth faithful pastors to proclaim your law and gospel. Grant hearers ears to listen and hearts to receive their word in faith. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, you preserve Jesse's faithful line by the incarnation of your Son. Give families and individuals strength to faithfully fulfill their vocation to love and forgive one another that we may be trained up in your fear, love, and trust. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, your Son rules over creation with justice and righteousness. Endow those in authority with the desire and ability to protect the innocent, punish the wicked, work for the common welfare. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, you come as the Prince of Peace, Bring your peace to all those suffering from war, unrest, fear, and oppression. Be with those who live in fear of crime and danger. Be their source of protection, strength, and hope. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Compassionate Lord, as we await the day when the wolf will dwell alongside the lamb and the pain and destruction are no more, grant us patience, comfort, and healing according to your will. Hear our prayers for all the sick especially all those on our prayer list, as well as for these whom special prayers have been requested. Lord, we lift up to you our sister Joni Dinan, who is undergoing medical tests, that these would guide the doctors to be able to provide her with complete healing. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We lift up to you our sister Ruth Wass. We pray that she has good test results from her CT scan coming up on Tuesday that you would continue the healing in her life and help her through the treatment that she's going through to keep her strong, both physically, mentally, and spiritually. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we ask that you would be with Paul Snyder, brother of Fred and Ruth Wass, as he is having health issues, that you would grant him complete restoration, health, and healing, and that he would glorify you for your healing hand. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we ask that you would provide comfort and healing for Charles Leach, Steve and Vicki's brother. You know his needs. You know how to fix them. Please provide them, and may he glorify you for your powerful healing of body, soul, and spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Heavenly Father, we lift up to you, Steve and Vicki Fakalak. Continue the healing for Vicki and be with Steve as he provides comfort and strength for her. Lord, in your mercy. Give wisdom and skill to the medical professionals who will care for all of these. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, you have given us your gracious gift of life. We celebrate that gift with all who celebrate birthdays this week, including Jack Stapish, Alex Beckett, Austin and Hunter Bissinger, William Keel, Doreen Glomsky, Noah Bradley, and Marlene Aldrich. As you have granted them life now, keep them steadfast in faith unto eternal life to come. Lord, in your mercy, stir up our hearts, O Lord, and make us ready for your only begotten Son, who comes to us this day in his true body and precious blood for the forgiveness of our sins. May all who feast upon him do so in repentance and faith. Lord, in your mercy, Heavenly Father, grant that we may be kept in joy and sustained in hope through every trouble and trial in this mortal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I would invite you now to stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary. 
that we should at all times and at all places give thanks to you. O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love, shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he has now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, <clears throat> Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Christ, strengthen and preserve you, body and soul, to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Amen. We rise. Let us pray. O God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and our minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. The love and peace of Christ Jesus, your Savior, has been poured out upon you richly and abundantly this day. In the same manner that he has shared these with you, pour out your gifts upon those around you who need to hear the gospel from your lips and by the works of your hands. In doing so, we serve the world as his church. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.